Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. So, I'm Walter. I'm an alcoholic. Um, I just actually celebrated my third birthday a few weeks ago. Um, and it's funny, I did my first, my, my first speech kind of by accident. Um, we were at a meeting at 615 one morning, and the speaker didn't show up, and somebody said, oh, Shubhita, so I had six months, and he said, why don't you come up and talk? And, um, and I, I stumbled through, and since then, um, I do, I do H&I work, I, I do um, beginner's meeting over at central office, um, I've been secretary and filled in for people, and I find myself actually talking uh, um, about what it's been like quite a bit, and um, I don't know, I, it, three years now, for, for whatever reason, um, three years seems like, like, for six months I went through a, a, a kind of a revisiting thing going, you know, I've been here six months, I'm sober, which is what I came in here for, and I had to, I had to revisit why I wanted to, why I wanted to stay, and I ended up, um, somebody asked one morning um, if there was anybody who'd be willing to give an hour a month to um, work at H9, being an H9 meeting, and I said, yeah, I think I could do that. Um, and I stayed, I'm, I'm still doing that. Um, but I three years, I mean, it, it's funny, I've... I've I put a lot of work in, I mean, they've done some service work, and a lot of those commitments are running out now, and I find myself kind of revisiting, again, once again, um, why I'm here, and, and this past week, I don't know, I found, it's like talking in meetings, um, my home group is a 6.15 in the morning, uh, 6.15 in the morning, um, and I, I found myself actually kind of thinking through what it is that, that I'm doing here. Um, I, you know, I mean, the, the bottom line is I'm sober, um, but I find myself, you know, it, it's like dealing with the book, dealing with, um, dealing with the traditions, um, you know, the, the whole suggestion thing has become um, a, big, a, a big deal for me because you know, I was on a um, committee over in Rockbridge, and we had a number of um, a number of things come up where we were dealing with behavioral issues. And you know, the traditions. I mean, they're great. I mean, it's like why I think the groups all get together. But you find, I mean, when it when push comes to shove, and you're actually dealing with, um, you know, can this person come back to a meeting here for any length of time? Um, everybody, everybody's idea of what the traditions actually mean can differ. Um, and I, I found myself walking out of a few meetings where I was really upset with some of the things, some of the decisions that the group made. Um, going through the, when I was, I was talking about this this week, I, I was sitting out, I was waiting for somebody over in Rockridge, and, um, Sitting outside, and somebody else came up, somebody, one of the old timers, and, um, I, that I had been there at the first beginners meeting I ever went to, and, um, he came out and he sat down and he asked me, you know, how much, how much, um, how much time do you have? And I said, oh, I, I'm just about three years now. And, and he said, I know you've got so much time. Said, yeah, I've got 32 years. And he was talking about a friend of his who, um, Came in at the same time he did, and um, he was there for about three years, and then he went out. And then he came back, and then he went out, and he said, "You know, this was 32 years ago. My friend is still coming to meetings here, but that was that was his um, his pattern. That's the way he's done it." And I said, "Isn't that great?" 
knows that AA has room for everyone like that. That AA is that kind of, you know, you write your own program. And he got really incensed with me. Um, and he said, you know, if it's not between pages 1 and 164 in the big book, it's not the program. And, I, you know, the, I, in the past I would have said something, and this time I just <coughs> said, you know, is, isn't it great that AA lets you write your own program like that? In my mind, I didn't send anything back to him. Um, but it is. And, you know, I, I've been... I've been through a number of times. I mean, the, the, the beginners meeting over here wanted to make some changes. We made some changes which for the first time in 10 years. Um, and people, some people were upset. Some people liked it. And I don't know. I, I, for me, it's like, you know, what's written up here is the place where I start. Um, the steps, having done the steps, the traditions, having uh, given respect to the traditions, the concepts, actually getting things done kind of on, on a group level. Um, and that's important. But what, you know what, what I've been thinking is like, I was talking to my sponsor about this uh, not long ago, and, and he said, well, you know, everybody who comes in here, you go to general service meeting, Everybody who comes in here at some point wants to change something. They want to rewrite the book. They want to change the tradition. They want to, they want to do this. They want to make all these changes. And pretty much it doesn't get done because, or it gets them very slowly, because that's the way that we operate. Um, and I, you know, that, that kind of graded with me, and at the same time, in thinking about it, um, that's kind of, you know, where, where I am right now, thinking this through three years in. Um, I've actually had a chance in, in, in service and talking to people to see kind of where AA is still growing. I mean, where it's, it, it, it does change. Um, being, uh, like, where, where it's like, you have to talk to people, you have to, you can have your opinions, other people have their opinions and they're all good. In some way, in some way, shape or form, you make them come together. Um, I was sharing one of these stories in, in the group the other, the other morning and, um, at the meeting, and somebody at the end commented and said, you know what a wonderful thing we, we've had, and people got pissed at that meeting, people were upset about a variety of things, but they said, this is a wonderful, we can come together and we can have this meeting and we can all, you know, we're coming from the spirit of love, the loving God um, part, and we can have this meeting, we can disagree, we can walk out of here, and you know, all of us, for right now, we're sober, and all of us are going to, you know, our, our intention right now is to go through the day sober. And, and really, that, I guess that's the bottom line for me. Um, it's like, I, 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 I need to see kind of that, that growth, that potential for growth. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not happy just kind of sitting back and letting things wash. Um, and at the same time, it does. It's there if you look for it. It's, I certainly found it. Um, and keep me coming back, so. Thank you. My name's Alyssa. I'm a colleague. Hey, Alyssa. Hi. Um, okay, I get really nervous but right before speaking. I'm just, I like to say that um, just because I like to say it. Um, so, uh, I'm an alcoholic. Um, my sobriety date is January 5th, 2014. Um, so in January, I celebrated four years, um, and I do have a home group. It's the 9 a.m. on Sundays at Rockbridge, and I have a sponsor who's great, and she's celebrating eight years today, um, and she asked me if I would speak, uh, because Guillermo asked her to speak, and, um, I said yes, because, uh, that's what I have to do in this program to stay sober. I have to say yes to things as much as I don't like it sometimes. Um, cause it is nerve wracking. It's nerve wracking to talk and get vulnerable. Um, but it's something that I have to do to stay sober. And, um, in my drinking and using, uh, I did whatever it took to stay loaded. And now that I'm sober, I have to do the same. I have to do, um, I have to go to any length to stay sober and protect my sobriety uh, because that's 
the number one most important thing in my life, and it has to be the most important thing in my life. Um, because without this program and without sobriety, I would not have a life um, to do all those other things that can sometimes get in the way of my sobriety, like, you know, hanging out with friends or just binge watching like Netflix shows that is like not a priority and um, showing up at meetings and sharing my story is a priority. So, um, yeah, and I get I get nervous and all day I was thinking about like, oh, I'm going to embarrass myself. I'm going to say something stupid. I'm going to get really vulnerable and form bunch of random people that I don't know and it's going to be weird and whatever but you know at the end of the day like none of that matters um at the end of the day I'm just a drug addict who was lucky enough to get sober and it doesn't matter if I stand up here and embarrass myself and it doesn't matter if I say some really dumb shit that nobody <laughs> can relate to um all that matters is that I stay sober and I help others achieve sobriety and um that's that's it that's fucking it. Um, but in that statement, uh, there a lot goes into that statement. Like, for me to stay sober, I have to do the steps. I have to do the steps, and I have to respect the traditions. Um, and there's a lot that um, goes into that. And um, I'll talk about that in a little bit, I'm sure, unless I forget. I don't know. I might. Um, sometimes when I get, I get really like nervous and I'll start babbling. I'm going to try not to do that. Um, so yeah, anyway, um, I will start with the boring stuff. Um, growing up, I'm not going to give you like a full, um, family tree history. Um, but yeah, when I was, when I was younger, um, I, I definitely right off the bat felt, um, insecure. I felt, irritable, restless, and discontent, um, from the very start. Uh, at three years old, um, I had got an autoimmune disease and, uh, broke out, had to tow an eczema and I looked like a little gremlin or something. Um, and that, uh, that, that stayed with me through most of my childhood. Um, so I grew up very isolated and uh, missing school a lot. Uh, other kids in class didn't want to touch me because they thought I was contagious. And um, yeah, so I just grew up hating my skin and wanting to rip it off. And then sometimes I did rip it off and I have scars now. Um, but yeah, I just, I felt different from the very beginning. And, um, you know, growing up, I realized that the eczema and the autoimmune stuff, um, that was definitely a reason that I had, but um, that wasn't the the only reason that I felt different and that I wasn't okay in my skin. It wasn't just my actual skin that I was uncomfortable with. It was everything going on inside. I felt um, I felt like there was something wrong with me, and um, everyone else like got it, like had this thing that I was just missing that I just could not could not relate to other people. I couldn't get along with other people. I just didn't understand how their brains worked. I just felt like I was so, so different. And every moment was just painful. I was just a fucking wreck. Um, constantly trying to get out of myself. Um, I was very, very dramatic. And, um, you know, when I got a little bit older, I had all these mental problems and I was on all these pills and, I was like, okay, so this, like, there's, there's something wrong with me. Everyone keeps telling me there's all these things wrong with me. And, um, I was always just very, very defiant and angry and, um, trying to get back at everyone. Um, so I started taking those pills that they were giving me and taking large quantities of them. Um, and I would, uh, yeah, I would, that's, that's really where it all started. I would just abuse the pills that my mom wanted me to take. And, um, you know, we had, I had, I didn't have the worst childhood. I mean, I grew up in Orange County, um, and my parents are together, but it was a tumultuous house. Uh, both my parents are hoarders and we would have infestations of bugs, uh, in the kitchen all the time weird species of bugs that I didn't know existed and they would just be there and I would just be cool with it and like, okay, this is my life. Um, but yeah, I was definitely sick all the time. And, um, if I could just get one moment where I didn't feel like 
shit, then I would take that moment and make it last as long as I could. And that was just my goal um, from a very young age. Um, just escape myself, escape the pain, uh, physical and mental pain that I was in constantly. Um, and, you know, I started, you know, I started smoking weed, I started popping pills, doing whatever I could, um, stealing alcohol, uh, getting into trouble at school, um, just all the normal shit that dumb teenagers do. Um, and that, you know, progressed. And, uh, when I was 15, I, I got into a little bit of trouble. Um, uh, I, I got caught with like way too much weed. I don't even remember how much it was, but way too much weed. And, um, I didn't really think anything of it because I'm like, you guys, like, I don't have any hard drugs on me. This is just weed. Like you don't get in trouble for that, but apparently you do. And so, um, yeah, I got, I got like all these charges slapped on me and they were like, we're going to make an example of you. And, um, <laughs> so, so I got expelled and I was charged with, uh, possession, distribution, and intent to sell because they were arguing with me that there was no way that all of that weed was just for me. Um, but it was, <laughs> it was just for me. I don't like to share. I'm not, I'm not very generous when it comes to that sort of thing. So yeah, as hard as I tried to explain to them that it was just mine, they, they were convinced I was a drug dealer. And I was like, whatever, at least it's just the weed that you found. Um, so yeah, uh, that was like my first stint. And what I learned from that, uh, was that I just had to be really sneaky and hide my shit so that I didn't get caught because I, I really did not enjoy being caught and having other people like take my things away and, um, tell me what to do and make me go to like court classes. And I had to do like AA meetings. Um, and I was just this weird, like 15 year old sitting in the back of an AA meeting. Like what is, what's going on? What are these people thinking? And welcome. If you're a weird 15 year old thinking like, what are these people doing? Um, just hang out and <laughs> talk to people. It'll be okay. Um, so, yeah, so, I mean, I, I just had no idea what AA was, and I didn't want anything to do with it. Um, I really didn't think, I thought, like, everyone else had a problem, but I was fine. And, you know, all my friends who were, like, shooting dope, I was like, you guys obviously have a problem, but I'm fine. I'm, I'm doing my own thing. And then, you know, when I started like smoking heroin, it was like, I smoke it. So I'm like, you know, I'm on a different level than you. Like you're shooting it up and like, you need some help. Like I have some numbers I can give you, you know, my mom works at a rehab, by the way, a drug and alcohol rehab. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I, I surrounded myself with people who I thought were like worse than me. Um, you know, people who like really had a problem and, um, that's how I justified my drinking and my using. Um, and then, uh, let's see, I went to continuation school, got out of there as fast as I could. I did not like school. I don't like people telling me what to do. Um, so I went to high school for like two and a half years and I was just like, you know what? I'm better than this. I don't, I don't need this shit. Um, so I, I went to beauty school when I was 17 and, um, yeah, I, uh, at, at that point, um, I was doing some managing and I was, um, getting off of the hard stuff and convinced myself that I could just drink and smoke weed and be a normal person and that would be fine for me. Um, so I did that and I was just drinking, you know, every single day, all day and smoking weed all day. Um, and, you know, I was in beauty school and I was 17 and I thought I was really cool. And, um, and then, uh, one night, like I just, I had blacked out and, um, some like fucked up shit happened and I had to, uh, go to the hospital and my buddies over at the, um, urgent care were like, Alyssa, are you okay? And I was like, yeah, I'm totally fine. They're like, well, actually you're not cause you have hep C. And I was like, oh, great. That's, that's not that's not what I want right now. Um, so, so that kind of spiraled me into a little bit of a depression. Um, it was, sorry, it was right after I turned 18, found out I had hep C. Um, and I was like, well, what do we, 
where do we go from here? Like, you know, I was at that point, I was really trying to manage everything. And I felt like, you know, uh, I'm, I'm doing my best and the world is fucking me over. So clearly like I shouldn't try to do my best. Um, and that point, like all bets were off and I started working at a hair salon, making cash under the table. And, um, you know, I just, everything was so accessible to me. I had all the cocaine I wanted and all the heroin I wanted. And, you know, I, I have hep C, so why, why should I, I'll just share needles with everyone, you know, whatever. (laughs) Fuck it. Like, (laughs) like I'm not trying to protect my body or anything. Um, you know, and I just felt worthless. I felt like, um, you know, my whole life, uh, I had been wronged and bad shit just kept happening and I just couldn't get out of it. And, um, I just felt like such a fucking victim, you know, like, why is all this happening to me? Why does like all all these, all these people want to fuck with me and every, everyone's out to get me. And, you know, I, I wouldn't take any responsibility for myself. Um, and I just blamed you for all my problems. Um, and I just felt like I have nothing to lose. Why should I care about myself? Nobody else does. Um, why should I fucking try to keep my shit together? It doesn't matter. Um, and I just went off the deep end and I just started, you know, doing everything I could. And, um, then one day, um, I still have that autoimmune disease and I still have it, but it's managed today. Um, I was at the hair salon. I had a client coming up and I just happened to have all these like open wounds around my body, like sores and stuff just from being dirty. Um, and, but I didn't want anyone to see that because then they might not want me to like work on their heads. Um, so I would, I would wrap my, all my wounds with like a bunch of bandages and just hide that shit from everyone because I needed my money. And, um, I was in the bathroom changing my bandages. My boss just barges in and I was like, that's so rude of you. What are you doing? And he's like, you need to go to the hospital right now. Like literally right now you're dying and you need to go to the hospital or you're fired. So I begrudgingly went to the hospital and, um, the doctors there were like, uh, yeah, you have MRSA and it's a day away from spreading to your heart. Like, what are you, what are you doing, little girl? What are you thinking? And I was like, well, I just, I need to go back to work and make some money so I can buy my drugs. Um, so can you just hurry this up and let me, let me out of here? Um, so that didn't happen. Um, I lost my job and, uh, not, <laughs> my, my boss was so sweet, yet he, um, he wanted to do everything to help me, but I was beyond that point. Um, I was just like, you know what? I can't, the doctor told me I couldn't work in, in the salon again. Um, or else it would pick up right where it started. Um, or right where it left off, I guess. Um, so that day I lost my career and that was my identity. And that was, you know, the only redeemable, uh, thing I had in my life. It was like, you're a piece of shit. You're a drug addict. Um, your life is horrible and you're this, you know, poor little victim. Um, and you know, you have this thing, you have this career, you're like cool hairstylist and you're like so punk rock. And, and then like that was taken away from me. And I was like, but my hair is blue. I have to keep dying it. And they're like, no, you can't, you can't dye your hair anymore. You got to give that up. So, um, just instantly my identity was gone. And, um, you know, that, that was like a turning point for me. And, um, I just went full blown heroin addict after that. I was like, you know what? I can't, can't deal with this shit. I'm just this poor woman who's just had all these rough things happen. So after that, um, yeah, it was just basically heroin and meth, like all day, every day. That's all I can do. And that went on for a while. Um, and I was, uh, working at a barber shop. Um, and I was like half dead trying to just keep my shit together and, um, working at a barber shop. And, uh, this guy comes in, he's got like gorilla glue in his hair and it's clogging up my, my clippers. And I'm really getting frustrated with him. And, um, next thing I know there's blood everywhere and I'm screaming at him 
and um, my boss fires me, and I'm like, what? that's so unfair. Like, why is everyone out to get me? Um, I had cut him, I guess. That's what they tell me. <laughs> so, yeah, I was, like, really high and sleep-deprived, and um, I was on, like, meth, coke, heroin, <laughs> like, hadn't slept in a couple days, and, um, yeah, so I got fired, and um, then my, uh, my cousin, who was actually a prostitute at the time, told me, Alyssa, like, you're struggling, and your life is not going well right now. You need to get help. And I just thought that was, like, the weirdest thing. I'm like, you're a prostitute. Why are you judging me? Like, how is this? I don't understand. Um, but I did. Uh, I did try and get help. I went um, went to live with my aunt in Texas, and um, I kicked on her couch. Bless her heart. She just let me kick for about a month, and she drove me to AA meetings, and her husband, my uncle, is a good AA, and um, he took me to meetings, and they took me to meetings every day, and um, I, for some reason, decided it was a good idea to uh, steal cough syrup from the grocery store, and then, like, continue to pretend like I was sober. Um, anyway, I drank so much cough syrup that my, uh, fingers and toes turned blue. And, um, then I was like, maybe, maybe this isn't working out. Um, so, so I was still determined to get sober because I was like, this is the right thing to do. My life is shit. I gotta, you know, get sober. Eventually went home, relapsed on meth, started hallucinating that bugs were eating my brain. And, um... I called everyone I knew and told them to get um, an exterminator because their their houses were infested with bugs, and uh, it was their fault that I was dying from. Um, I think I I think I had found bird mites. I had decided that they were bird mites, and that I was dying from bird mites, and. Um, <laughs> I wasn't. Spoiler alert. <laughs> I was not. I did not have any bird mites. I was just crazy. Um, so, yeah, after that, went to rehab, finally. Um, and uh, that that was my first real introduction to AA because I was actually sober. And um, there I found, um, I, I found a lot of similar people. I was like, oh, there are people who are just like me and have problems just like me and you know the world is out to get them too that's such a weird coincidence and then like oh wow I guess I'm not very special um which is hard for somebody like me to come to that realization that I'm not like the most unique special person in the world um so I did come to that realization uh and a uh, AA and, and rehab were great. I was like, cool, I can just, I have a cot I can sleep in. People are feeding me. I'm, I'm like the healthiest I've ever been. Um, and it was, it was cool. I didn't have to worry about anything. And um, I got to like go to meetings and like there were all these like really cool, hip, like good looking people. It's like, oh, cool. I can like, I can get with these people. That's cool. I can like meet some meet some guys, like, this is, I can do this. Uh, so I did that, and, um, and then I met, I met someone, and, um, and I decided that it would be a good idea if we did heroin together. So, um, just one time, and it would be fine. Everything would be fine. So I did that, and, um, and yeah, so we did heroin. Actually, no, he didn't because he was in drug court and he stayed sober. And I was like, just buy me heroin and I'll do it. And I'll pretend like we're doing it together. Um, so I did that. And then, um, yeah, then um, I, I went back to my rehab and I cornered a girl in the bathroom and made her pee in a cup. 
<laughs> that was really uncomfortable and awkward. I don't think she liked that very much. Um, yeah. But I needed I needed her pee, so that's what I, that was the logical next step. Um, so I passed the drug test. Everything was fine. No one, ex- like, no one thought anything w- weird was going on with me. Um, they were like, "Yeah, Alyssa's fine. She passed her drug test." And then uh, we're getting we get in the car. We're in the van. We're driving up the street. And then I just explode and just decide, like, "Oh my god." I'm really sick right now. And I jump out of the van and just like do a tuck and roll and then book it back to the rehab because I'm like, well, they know that something's up with me now. So I got to just get my shit and I got to just run away. So I start um, booking it up to the house and it's, it was in um, Dana Point, Orange County. So all the houses are on those hills and they got the big, like five staircases up to the house. The stairs were so exhausting that I just, I passed out on the stairs. And so they found me, and I guess like two hours later or something, um, they found me, and they were like, um, yeah, so we're going to have to do another drug test. <laughs> like, okay, fine, whatever. And, um, and then I, I pass out again, and um, I come to... I'm in a car, pass out again, come to again, and then I'm in a detox center in Santa Ana, and they're like, what day is it? I'm like, I have no idea. Why are you asking me what day it is? I have no fucking idea what day it is. And it had, I had, like, apparently skipped through New Year's. So um, it was 2014, and I was like, oh, that's weird. Um So I'm in this detox and, um, you know, I'm thinking like, wow, my life has come to this. Like everything is just a mess. I hate myself. Um, I hate being alive. Uh, I, I can't do normal things. I can't be a normal person. Like what is the point? You know, like I should really turn my life around. Um, but then there was a guy there who thought that I was, like, attractive or something. And um, he was getting, like, all the good pills. And I felt like that wasn't fair, that he was getting the good pills, and I wasn't. So I decided that he needed to give me his pills. So I convinced him that I would sleep with him, and I took all of his pills, and I got super fucked up, passed out, and then I left. And um, they tried to put me back in rehab, I said no, and um, I was like, I don't need this, uh, so I left, and um, that at that point, my there's something going on with my brain, and I honestly, I'm going to get like serious for a second, um, I have no idea what happened to me, but um, I think it was shock, and I could not use my brain at all. I had booked it from the rehab. I had like a bag full of clothes or something. And um, I was just running around on the street, didn't know where to go. I went back to um, the guy who got me the heroin the first time, Cameron. I went back to his house, tried to be okay with him. And um, there was just something inside me that was just like, run, run, run. And um, I couldn't sit still. I couldn't sleep. I couldn't eat. I couldn't do anything. My brain was completely blank. He was trying to talk to me. I couldn't understand it. And I booked it again. I just ran away. Um, And I was just going through streets. I was going through old friends' houses. I would just show up and be all crazy. And they're like, okay, whatever. Um, I would sleep on people's couches. I don't even know what happened in the next couple days. Um, But I was just out of it. And um, I remember walking down the street, and um, I I honestly didn't know up from down. I I couldn't even recall, like, my best friend's name. I couldn't couldn't access any information that was in my brain. I was completely fried. And um, I was really fucking scared. Like, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know where to go. Um... I, my family was done with me. 
everyone was done with me. And I just remembered that there was this AA meeting that I had to go to when I was 15 years old, being a little brat. And I had found like some change. I had like a, I don't know, a couple of quarters. I took a bus there and I found this fucking meeting miraculously. I have no idea how I found it, but I found it. And I walked in right as the meeting started and I sat down in a chair in the back and this old man who I honestly don't remember what he looks like, but when I think about it, I picture like the old man from up and he came up to me and he just put his hand on my shoulder and asked if I wanted a cup of coffee and I just exploded in tears and I said, yes, obviously. I was like, yeah, I need some fucking coffee. I don't know what day it is. Um, so he got me a cup of coffee, and for the first time, my ears opened, and I actually listened to what was going on. And I sat down, and I felt safe. And I had never felt really safe anywhere else before. Um, but I felt like I was home. And um, from there, my friend's mom picked me up and she took care of me. She took me in and I slept on their couch, uh, for seven months. And every single day I just slowly retaught myself how to read and write, um, how to talk to people, uh, how to look people in the eye, how to, um, wake up in the morning and brush my teeth and comb my hair. And I just little by little, I became more human. And I would walk to AA meetings. Um, I got a sponsor who was like, I'm not going to baby you. I'm not going to feel sorry for you. Um, you're going to have to like work for this if you want this. So, um, and that point, like I, I wanted it and, um, I, I didn't have anything else going for me in my life. I didn't see a way out. I, this was the only thing left. Um, and so I did it. And for seven months, um, I, so my friend's mom's dad lived with them and, um, he, he was, uh, he was just like fucking great. He was a great guy. He would just listen to me babble and just, I would practice having conversations with him because I couldn't have conversations with anyone. And, um, after seven months, then I, um, finally I got a job at a rehab um, where they gave me housing and, um, a job. So I was working a full-time job and I finally had a place of my own to live and I wasn't living out of a duffel bag anymore. Um, so I was starting to be like a burden and I felt bad about that. Um, so I finally, like I had a room, I had a place to stay, I had a job and, um, there were other women around me who were suffering and I got to see like the, the very bottom. I got to see women in their 70s come in with absolutely nothing, who were homeless prostitutes, um, you know, dying, dying of alcoholism. And I got to help those women. And I got to stay up late with them and hear their fucking war stories and tell them that everything was going to be okay. And that kept me sober um, for a little bit longer. And then um, you know, I worked the steps with my sponsor and the first time around, like, I'm not going to bullshit you. I did not believe that shit. And like, it was hard. Like step four, I was like, I guess I can kind of write down some stuff, but like, I was still so fucked up in my head and I had all of my fucking character defects. When I got to, um, step eight, like l make a list of people that I've harmed, I was like, what the fuck? No. Like I, everyone, did you like forget that everyone has harmed me and I don't owe anyone amends? Like the world is out to get me. Um, so I struggled through the steps the first time, but that's, that's okay that I did that because, um, you know, you're not going to, it's, I don't know. It's, it doesn't have to be done perfectly. And, um, just the fact that you fucking do it is enough. Um, so I struggled through the, the first round of steps. Um, and then I spot, I got to sponsor people and, um, you know, I got all these fucking great sponsees who kept me sober for the next year. And, um, I was able to stay sober for two years and it was like, what the fuck happened? How did I, how did I do this? Um, 
and then, you know, I, uh, I started like doing life. I started feeling like, okay, I'm, I'm a real person now. I'm, I, I'm an actual person. I can be a part of society. I can date people. I can like, you know, go to the grocery store and buy food. And, um, and you know, like all these things started like becoming more important to me. And, um, I got in a relationship and, um, I started putting that relationship before everything else. Um, I started, you know, here's this person who like, I started dating someone who I'd idolized for a long time. Um, someone who I literally had their poster on my wall when I was 15 and, um, like looked up to them in the punk community. And, um, and so I, I thought that I was better than everyone else because I was like, Oh, look at me. Look at fucking me doing this, whatever. Um, and like, you know, six months of that and I just undid all those steps and I like took back all the amends that I'd ever made. And, um, I took back my fears and, um, I, I, you know, said, fuck you, God, like, I don't need you. Um, and I found myself in a really, really fucked up place. And I was miserable. And then, you know, just in one month, like, the guy was gone. Uh, the job was gone. My parents were, like, sick of me again. Um, which, that's another thing that I should have talked about, but I'm running out of time. Um, the first time I made amends, um, my relationship with my mom was just fucked my whole life. We did not get along. Um, we would like chase each other around the house with knives, didn't get along. And, um, and I was able to restore that relationship, even just doing the bare minimum in this program. And I never thought that that was possible. Um, but I was able to do that. And, um, so that was probably the biggest thing that I got from doing the steps the first time. Um, but anyway, back to, um, being miserable again. Uh, I had un, I had undone everything, all the work that I did in here. And um, I got to a place where I was dry as fuck. And um, I wasn't helping other people. I wasn't um, doing 10 steps. I wasn't uh, fucking doing anything. I was just being a dick. And um, so I, I got in my minivan and I drove up here to run away from everything. Um, and <laughs> I was literally living out of my minivan, just feeling like, okay, I'm sober and I'm still crazy and everything sucks. Um, and I got here and I decided to re, uh, recommit myself. Um, and I got a sponsor. Her name is Kat. She's the one that I talked, I mentioned earlier. Um, <laughs> And I decided to start again, um, which is great because you can always start again in AA. I don't know if anyone's told you that, but yeah, you can start again. There are no rules. Um, <laughs> so yeah, Kat and I started working together and I, she treated me like I was a newcomer and, um, that's what I fucking needed. Um, so I started working the steps with her and she told me like no dating, and no sponsoring until you're done with the steps with me. And we're going to fucking do this, like, hard this time. <laughs> because, like, the, that last time you did the steps, like, that was cute. But no. Like, we're we're going to do it for real this time. And it's been the best experience of my life. Um, it's been a year and a half. And I haven't dated anyone. <laughs> which is weird, but cool. Um, and... Everything has changed. Um, absolutely everything. I got in touch with a higher power that I can actually like pray to, I guess, kind of. Um, it's still hard for me, but I do it. Um, because all it's all all you really need is an open mind. I don't know if you've read the twelve and twelve, but also if you're new, like just just you know, ignore me. I'm being stupid. Um, it's people, people are really cool and get like a lot of like promises in here. And, um, I'm just like a bad example of like, you know, don't, don't do what I did. Um, do it right the first time. And then you don't have to start over three years in. Um, but if you do, it's okay because I'm doing it and it's fine. Um, everything's fine. Just, oh my God. I'm, I'm okay. Anyway. Um, <laughs> So, 
yeah, uh, we, <laughs> we've been working the steps and, um, I did the fourth step, the, the most intense digging I've ever done in my life. And I found out all my patterns and I, you know, I got to see all the damage that I did to other people. I finally realized that, um, the world isn't out to get me and I'm not a victim, which is a really great realization. If you guys are thinking that you are like a victim in any way, um, it's, I guess it's just freeing to know that you're not. It's really freeing. It's freeing to know that you're not the center of the universe and that there are much more important things going on than like, you know, your daily life. Um, it's, it's really great. Um, and, um, yeah, I got to make some free, you know, hardcore amends. I got to look at all my character defects and pray for them to be removed. They're not gone. I can tell you that right now. Like I have a lot of character defects, but the important thing is that I'm aware of them and, um, I don't have to participate in them. I can see them and I can hear my brain telling me all this dumb shit and I can just be like, all right, that's not, that's not reality. I don't have to listen to that. Um, and you know, I, I can really like realize that, you know, I, 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 what I said in the beginning, at the end of the day, I'm just a drug addict that was lucky enough to get sober. And it's only because of my higher power and you guys that I'm able to be sober and, um, it's a fucking gift and it's the best thing that I've ever had in my life. Just to sound like super, super corny. Um, but it is like, I still struggle. I still have bad days. I have depression. I have anxiety, but I also have like all these fucking tools to help me get through that. And I have a wonderful sponsor and I have people in my life who hold me accountable, who tell me like, Hey, Melissa, fucking knock it off. You're being an asshole. Get like your ego is just like out of whack. And I can, I can put myself back in check and I can like get down to like the basics of what really matters. And what really matters is staying sober and helping other alcoholics achieve sobriety. Like that's our primary purpose. And that's it. You don't have to do this program perfectly. You can do it however you want. It's not like set in stone. It's not, there's no like rules. There's no like shaming you can always come back. Like we, we're just a fellowship helping each other stay sober. We're just a bunch of fucking drug addicts and alcoholics. And the fact that like we can stay sober one day is good enough. Like I, I don't, um, you know, I try not to compare myself today. My story is different than everyone else's story. Like I, it doesn't matter if I've done more drugs than you or you have, you know, I've never been to prison. Like maybe like, cool, you're more hardcore, but that doesn't like, you know, it doesn't, none of that matters. Like if, you know, it's, we're all in this together and we just have one day, we just have one day at a time. And, um, if you, if you need help, fucking ask, reach out. I can't tell you how many times like I've bit my tongue and not asked for help when I needed it. There's no shame in it. Ask for help. Someone will help you. Um, and then you can help someone else, which is a really beautiful thing. Okay, that's all I think. I, that's all I think. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.